recommendations. Okay, um, for my next talk, and, and I'm going to be um, spending some time on discussing some of the agent-based modeling process, but before doing that, I thought um, we would do well to discuss some basic features of agent-based models, some basic um, characteristics that um, uh, that uh, distinguish these models from other other sorts of, of modeling. Um, I'm not going to be spending too much time on this. I think the best way to really sh to to engage you with it is to show it to you. But um, uh, given that many of you are from different backgrounds, I did want to um, note some um, some characteristics of these models to allow you to orient yourselves um, more quickly. So within an agent-based modeling context, we're typically dealing with one or more populations composed of, of agents depicted, very importantly, individually. Um, and each is associated with uh, some parameters, some, some characteristics that don't change or that change only rarely, things like gender ethnicity. Um, notably, in contrast to an agent, we need to divide things up in a discrete fashion in terms of the characteristics of the population. We can represent both discrete aspects of, of parameters or person's properties, things like gender, ethnicity, or continuous ones, things like someone's birth weight or someone's income. So where in an aggregate system dynamics model, we would be dealing with something like income deciles or income quartiles. Um, we don't have the luxury of distinguishing people as to their precise income. Here, here we can. It's just a, a property of that agent that happens to be stored as a double precision value rather than, a, than as, a, uh, uh, as a category. So um, secondly, so agents are these parameters, these properties that change only infrequently or not at all. Um, they have some aspect of state, some evolution of their status over time. Things like their age, their smoking status perhaps, um, the networks that they manage, because networks are often dynamic in character. We shape our networks, and then our networks shape us. Our preferences might be evolving over time. The, the, um, our, our morbidities, our, our risk factors are commonly features that are captured dynamically. Those are aspects of our state. A given agent evolves over time with respect to its state. And we describe rules for evolving that state. In that last model we've seen, where did we see rules specified for evolving someone's state over time? Where do we capture the state in the first place? How do we, where do we capture someone's characteristics in that last model? The state chart. And where do we describe the rules for evolving it, sort of the rules that govern when someone switches from one state to another? In the transitions in the state chart. That's right. So those are rules. Those are specified in a more uh, high level, more declarative way than a traditional and agent-based modeling. Traditional agent-based modeling, which emerged um, uh, originally from computer sciences, is kind of meshed and merged with uh, microsimulation, which emerged from the, um, the economics field. We see um, rules traditionally specified in a, in a textual fashion, but a state chart is a specification. And in computer science, uh, we find um, declarative language is highly, um, highly helpful in terms of uh, of, of specifying um, models for various domains. So we have rules for evolving that state, and then we have some means of interaction with other agents via environments. So in that last model, the means of interacting with other agents was spatial. We spread, spread infection to our neighbors um, via a message, but we also could spread it over networks. The, uh, these models additionally have uh, spatial uh, and temporal characteristic time horizons, spatial, spatial horizons and characteristics. Sometimes we discretize space, sometimes discretize time to evolve the model in lockstep, and then some initial state to them. Okay? Um, for those familiar with uh, agent-based, for system dynamics modeling, it may be fruitful to reflect on the fact that you could think of agent-based modeling as kind of system dynamics modeling, an aggregate system dynamics model turned on its head in the sense that in a system dynamics modelation up according to their state, it's organized according to people's state and other characteristics. So for example, we divide the population to susceptibles, exposed, infectives, and recovered, so we count the number of individuals in each of those categories, right? Um, if if 
uh, we wish to distinguish susceptible males from the susceptible females, Conce at a conceptual level, we would create another stock. We could do it by subscripting, but what it amounts to at a mechanical level is, is another stock. Um, so we do organize the model according to people's characteristics, their state and their properties, and we count the information that we maintain, the data that we maintain on such models, the count of individuals that fall in each little bin. By contrast, ladies and gentlemen, in a system, in an agent-based model, we organize the model, not by state or characteristics, but we organize it by person in the population. And we then maintain as data, as the, as the information, we maintain the state and characteristics of that person. So the organization is kind of the flip of what we see in a, in a system dynamics model. Both are useful, both lend insight, but they're, they're kind of um, orthogonal to each other, or sort of the, uh, uh, the flip, flip of each other. I might also note that in an agent-based model, if we have nesting that goes on, say a, a person within a family, and a family within a neighborhood, and a neighborhood within a city, we capture that within, a, um, within an agent-based model in a nested way. So we have, for example, in the course of this workshop, we'll see, we'll see uh, hierarchical models. You'll find them on the example models given to you, where we depict people as being in several nested contexts. And we can capture that very easily in an agent-based model. By contrast, within a, a system dynamics models, we can capture these nested contexts but we would do so in the same basic, uh, sort of a horizontal way, in the same basic model. They're just different variables within the same model. So we might divide up, for example, a population of several cities, and we have susceptible in city one and susceptible in city two. Exposed in city one, exposed in city two. And we could total up the number of people infected or the fraction of people infected in a given city, the prevalence of infection city one, prevalence of infection city two, then prevalence of infection the whole population. And they'd just be different models different variables within the same model, at the same kind of level as one another. Whereas in an agent-based context, we have nesting going on. We have these levels of nested context, which is very useful, for example, when comparing to data that may be drawn from hierarchical linear modeling or mixed effects models, where we have where effects captured at different levels, multi-level statistical modeling. Okay? Um, so in an agent-based model, if a, for example, if a city in the real world contains people it's similar in the agent-based model. We have this nesting going on. So what about these populations? What, what are these populations like? Well, in an agent-based model, we divide, you know, we specify a population within our model of people. We specify what personhood means in our model. And then we specify a population of people here. And, and then we depict the model while it runs uh, as divided up into a, a set of particular individuals. Each of these individuals shares the characteristics of personhood, but differ in their, in their details. Um, so with each such person, for example, as an aspect of personhood, we might say each person in my model, in this kind of stylized depiction of personhood or personness that I specify for my model, we have people divided into ethnicity or sex and income. And so it is with our population that will divide up uh, this into set of people, while the model's running, we have particular people with particular sexes and ethnicities associated with them, and particular incomes. Notice that some of these characteristics are categorical and some are, are continuous in nature. A notable uh, advantage when it comes to representing, say, the impact of birth weight on later life outcomes. Um, we additionally specify state and rules, and we saw that with our state charts earlier. This is not the only mechanism. Any logic is highly, uh, highly uh, flexible in this area, as many others. Um, you can specify these rules in any number of different ways, but it's a particularly crisp and, um, and transparent representation. And we can um, have multiple state charts for a given person, where each state chart might represent um, their state with respect to different sets of conditions. For example, with respect to infection, another with respect to care-seeking behavior, another with respect to a chronic, chronic underlying illness that may adversely affect their immune strength. Um, we can with other agents, for example, networks in which we organize individuals. And then we could see patterns that result over time. We see the emergence not only going on over time, such as shown at the bottom here, but over space. Um, 
this, uh, this availability of a readily used interface was one of the features that I mentioned in response to Sid's questions about what, you know, what recommends any logic in the space of, of, of modeling platforms. Um, when I first saw this, uh, I've been doing agent-based modeling now for about 25 years, since 1990, I think it was. I did my, you know, it was the summer of 1990, I started my first encounter with it. And um, I, I must confess, um, early on I viewed it as kind of eye candy of sorts. It was interesting, but not, not of all that, it didn't have that much gravity to it. But um, I can tell you now, having worked in a number of modeling projects where the occurrence of a visual representation led to insights that would have been very difficult to capture otherwise. It's not merely eye candy. It's important. It's important for learning. It's important for, for, for gaining uh, substantive qualitative insights as to what's going on. This particular type of diagram, in fact, in a very similar model that came out of one of my class projects, um, uh, it, um, it literally um, stopped months of planning um, for a more aggregate model um, in, in terms of how we'd represent the distribution of, of prions. These are infectious prions, these misfolded proteins, and their concentrations in the environment. And it made us realize that, no, we need to take a different strategy with our aggregate model. We can't represent these as uniformly distributed over the space. In other cases, I've, I've gained insights. I was working for months with some data, and just seeing it visually clued me into something that I spent months speculating about. So it's not merely eye candy. We see these sort of spatial dynamics occurring at uh, different forms, and dynamics over topologies, over, over networks as well. Um, in contrast to, to uh, system dynamics models, agent-based models are typically stochastic, um, not always. There's things like the, uh, the Conway game of life that are deterministic. But for the most part, they're stochastic. And we saw that in our last model. Those fringes we saw in the um, periphery of that expanding, that expanding uh, network. The, uh, the fact that there were those little scattered dots within the internals of that wave of infection, those are indications of stochastics. And generally, because of this, to ensure model results are not merely flukes, the model has to be run many times. These stochastics are, are not liabilities. They do impose higher computational costs. They're assets, however. They are assets because they clue us into the, um, uh, the occurrence of uh, uh, similar sort of variability of real world data. And they can give in real insights into whether the sort of patterns we see in real world data, jumping around, et cetera, are likely to result from different causes. Um, likely to represent problems with their dynamic hypotheses. So perhaps a single run of the model, we get certain specific output. And running the model many, many, many times with different um, vagaries of random number seeds, with different little chance events occurring, we see things um, in distributions as coming out of the model. Um, fortunately, this is very easy in any logic. Um, and we'll see how to do that. Now, as I noted, it's very straightforward to build ABMs featuring multiple levels of context. So uh, we'll see in this boot camp how we can build up a model consisting, for example, of cities arranged in one type of network, a, a distance-based network where two cities are connected if and only if they lie within a certain distance of one another. And within each city, we have scale-free networks, for example. Uh, so um, some notable strengths of agent-based models. Um, in the span and sort of the scope of, of, of uh, dynamic modeling techniques. They can capture continuous and discrete heterogeneity. Sounds like a minor thing, but is of considerable uh, import in certain research questions. They could support targeted interventions for which that, inter that heterogeneity is either um, something we take advantage of in the intervention or something that we need to be careful about the interventions um, effecting. For example, uh, we want to be more concerned about transfer effects. The fact that an intervention, we don't merely want it to gain, on average, gain for the population. But we want to make sure certain populations are not disproportionately uh, adversely affected while others gain disproportionately. So we want to make sure that those effects are, are, are equitable in the population. Um, for cases where we want to represent network and spatial context, um, multi-level nesting, within the population that can be very effective. Captuating situated decision-making on the part of agents, 
We want agents that, who have agency and have certain preferences and behave accordingly, um, and who exhibit learning over time from their particular experiences. An agent-based model can be very effective. If we want to capture longitudinal information, aspects of an agent's history, if that aspect of history is important for their subsequent life course, if that aspect of history is important for learning, um, uh, really an agent-based modeling approach is highly recommended, an individual-based modeling, because doing so within a, a stock and flow model is, is not, not feasible. Um, they allow us more precise and endogenous characterization of certain effects of interventions, of their outcomes. Uh, the visualization can aid communication and intuition, particularly with those who are used to dealing with things at an individual level, say clinicians who deal with individual patients, and when engaging with a model, like to deal with a model that, that speaks to them in the terms that they understand, speaks to them about specific agents. And finally, with these models, we can use them as synthetic ground truths of sorts. Um, we can use them to plausibly evaluate statistical instruments or study designs because we have a representation of the study population in a way that might mirror a real world population. An imperfect representation, but one that can be valuable for assessing the, the, the limitations of various um, strategies for, for um, statistically analyzing uh, a population or, or, or uh, study designs on that population. Okay, so those are some notable um, features of agent-based modeling. I've rushed through that because I think you're going to be getting a lot of exposure to this. Any questions on that before I go on to looking specifically at the toolbox any logic allows us to build up and that we're going to be covering for the next two or two and a half days? Any questions? No? Okay. Um, I think many of you are familiar, but...